Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. You know, God is an extremely good God. And, you know, it's always good to, you know, just get in the word of God and, you know, exposing the word of God and sharing the word of God. You know, um, we have been, you know, talking about the dispensation, the seven dispensation, right? And um, just before we get into the word, I, you know, just want to breathe a word of prayer. I greet those, forgive me, I greet all of us who, who are tuning in. You know, God richly bless you tonight. Hope that, you know, the word will really, you know, do as God would want it to do. So let us just breathe a word of prayer tonight. And then we get in the word. Father, we magnify your name. We glorify your name. Jesus, you are king of kings. You are Lord of lords. We thank you for all you have done for us and for all that you are doing and for what you will do. God, as we get in your words tonight, we pray, God, that your words will go forth, that, you know, they will accomplish what they will. We pray, God, that your people be edified and that you be glorified take full control right now. We commit this session into your hands and let your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. You might not be watching tonight, but you might watching, be watching sometime in the future. We also greet you in the name of the Lord. So we started out looking at the dispensation, the seven dispensation, and you know, we gave some important, you know, reasons why we should study the dispensation. We're just doing a recap, you know, so that we can bridge the gap between the last time we were here and now. And we said that, you know, it is important to study the dispensation um, to be able to rightly divide the word of God. So we're going to get into our slides and we are just going to do the recap quickly and then you know we get into the first dispensation that you know we will look at which is the dispensation of innocence right so we said that the reason why we should study the dispensations are one to rightly divide the word of god right the bible tells us in the book of second timothy 2 verse 15 study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? We made the point the last time that, you know, if the, word is, if the word is able to be rightly divided, then the word can also be wrongly divided. And if the word is wrongly divided, it means that folks are led astray. So you want to rightly divide the word so that, you know, you will save folks who listen to you. The Bible says, who will they hear except, you know, a preacher is sent. And you want to rightly divide the word because when you rightly divide the word, when the word is presented, you are presenting life. Folks who are unsaved will hear the word and they will accept the word and, you know, they will get saved. And that's a good thing. But if the word is not rightly divided, then it means that folks would be led astray. And at the end of the day, they will find themselves in a devil's hell. So the first reason we give is to be able to rightly divide the word. The second is to strengthen our belief. We made the point the last time that we all have a belief system, right? And at the heart of our belief systems are what we call presuppositions. These are some things that we hold dear to ourselves, all right? But they are not so easily proved, proven. And we want, as we get in the scriptures, as we get in the study, to be able to strengthen our belief, to strengthen our belief system. Um, if our belief, we, we stressed the point the last time, that if our belief in certain aspect of scripture is warped, then the entire thing, our belief on the whole thing or the whole scriptures, you know, will be, you know, warped. So we want to make sure that we strengthen our belief system. Um, we don't want it to be a thing where when the storms are blowing, the wind of doctrine is blowing, that we be tossed to and fro. But we want to be firmly 
rooted and firmly anchored to Jesus Christ. And it's important then to strengthen our belief system. The third thing we said that, you know, we, um, what reason why we should study the dispensation is to clear up the misunderstanding, right? That is what, you know, I would like to clear up some of the misunderstanding. So when we look at the dispensation, we are going to see the, the, the role of, the, of law and grace, you know, and santification and see how they play a role in our lives in today. Um, when we look at the dispensation um, in clearing up the misunderstanding, we are going to see clearly how things, you know, things that should come or should happen, or they will happen, and, they, and we will see that in chronological order. And then we want to, you know, look at it to see God's purpose and his distinction between the church and Israel. And a lot of times folks do study the they do not separate Israel and the church. And we are saying to us tonight that it's important that when we study the word of God, right, we clear up, we, we put a, 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 a good distinction between Israel and the church. We look at two passages the last time. One is taken from Matthew 5, verse, sorry, Matthew 10, 5 to 6. And we, we're just going to look back at these two scriptures quickly. Matthew 10, 5 and 6, and then Matthew 28, 19 to 20, right? So it's important then that we, you know, we put a distinction between Israel and the church, right? So when we look at this scripture, the, the, the Jesus Christ, you know, he, 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 he commissioned his disciples and he, he sent them forth. And Matthew... 10, 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not. Right? But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then the scripture in St. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. So Jesus gave the, the disciples a commission and he said go not unto the Samaritans I, 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 I said it the last time that Samaritans if you are not a Jew you are a Gentile right and Jesus when he sent out his disciple at that time he told them not to go to any Gentile don't go into the city of the Samaritans but go to the lost sheep of the host of Israel then now in St. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he gave a different commandment. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So this was now including Jews and Gentiles. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. So we say that, you know, folks tend, folks who tend not to put a distinction between Israel and the church, you know, always have a problem, you know, um, explaining, you know, these two, pass these two passages. So I'm saying to us that it's important, you know, as we get into the word and as we study we make sure that we put a distinction between Israel and the church. We made the point, next slide, we made the point that we were going to, you know, look this dispensations in a, um, systematically. We are going to take a systematic approach, you know, in studying, right? Because, you know, if we do not do this, then, you know, we'll find ourselves getting into different aspects and, and, you know, the study will just be drawn up. So we just want to focus zero in on some things. And these are the things that we say that we are going to look at. So we want to look at the beginning of the dispensation. And, we, you know, we're just going to look, just go briefly go through, look at what the dispensation is about. Um, look at the characters that were involved in the dispensation. And then we want to look at the command that was given or what was expected of mankind at that time. You know, we, we said it the last time that you're going to find that in the dispensation of conscience 
there wasn't really a command that was given. It was expected of mankind that they would allow their conscience, you know, to lead them. Um, but we are going to see that after sin came in, that, you know, man just head down a road, you know, and they, they departed so far from God. And then we want to look at man's failure to obey God's command, right? Because, you know, in every dispensation, there is a, a, um, a command that was given or something that was expected of man. And we want to look at, you know, man's failure in each dispensation to, you know, do, you know, what God would have us to do. Then we want to look at the judgment what was, that was handed out. Because in every dispensation, the judgment was handed out. But our judgment, judgment will be handed out. But with every dispensation, with every judgment that should take place or have taken place, then the Lord has made a way of escape. And we are going to look at, you know, what the scripture says and how God, you know, is so merciful and that his, his mercy is endured forever and that his grace is to all generation. Then we want to look at the mode of deliverance or salvation because every dispensation, God has made a way for salvation. He has made a way for deliverance from the power and effects of sin, right? And then we want to look at one or two takeaways from each dispensation. So what I want to do here is probably just take out the two points that, you know, would jump out to me from the dispensation and then elaborate on them. So because really we want to, you know, look at these takeaway to see how they can help us to live for God. Or, yeah, how they can help us to live for God or how they can, you know, know better our relationship with God. And then we want to look at what it is that we can learn from the Lord. So what is a dispensation? It is not simply, let, it is not simply a period of time in which God deals with mankind. We said this the last time. It is an administration or stewardship of time. We took the Greek word from Ephesians 1 verse 10 when the Apostle Paul talks about the dispensation of time. So we now say that the dispensation, a dispensation can be considered as an order of things or a system or a way of doing things over a period of time. So remember, you know, it, it, it is how God wants things to be done and this happened over a period of time. It is his dealing with mankind. Remember the last time we made the link between, between mankind and God, right? And we made the link between time and man. And we said that, you know, the only reason for time is because, you know, God created man. God had a plan and he created man. And the only reason why God stepped out of eternity and entered into time is really to deal with mankind. So a dispensation then, we said, can be considered as an order of things, a system or a way of doing things over a period of time. So the seven dispensations, there are seven dispensations that we want to look at. I said it before that there are some folks, you know, they believe in some folks would have 13 dispensations. Some folks would count as many as 30 dispensations. But for what we, our lesson, we are going to look at the seven dispensations, right? Um, there are seven dispensations, um, the dispensation of innocent, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and the millennial kingdom, which is a dispensation that, you know, is to come. In each dispensation, there are recognizable patterns, right, of how God worked with those living at that time. Um, God gives the responsibility to people. He said that this is what I want you to do, and the people fail. And because, of, because the people fail in terms of disobeying the command of God. They are judged for this failure, right? And then after they are judged for this failure, God now extends grace, mercy, and hope for the future. And this is just how he operates. You know, the, 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 and I'm going to say it again, but the, 
the, the righteousness of God demand judgment. But the, 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 the grace of God says that, you know, he is going to forgive and he is going to make a way of deliverance. So in Genesis 1, 27 through to 30, I'm going to ask us to find that passage and we're going to look at it together. Genesis 1, 27 to 30. So we are looking now at the beginning of the dispensation, the dispensation called innocent, right? And are the Edenic. It is considered the dispensation of innocent because Adam and Eve knew no sin. There was, they were made by God. This dispensation, dispensation covered the period of time with Adam and Eve in the garden. So we're looking at the beginning of dispensation. This is our point one. Genesis chapter 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree healing seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the year, and to everything that keepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so, so like I was saying, the dispensation covers the period of Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve were blessed. The Bible says that the Lord God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fall of the year and every living thing that moveth on the earth. So, so man had this dominion, brethren, that he was able to rule the entire earth over the fish, over the birds, over everything that was on earth at that time. Man had dominion over them. Um, the Bible says that God blessed them. They had no need they had no need. Everything they needed was already provided. God gave them every herb, bearing seed, every tree, in the which is fruit, yielding seed for the meat. So everything that they needed before they, before God made them, God created everything that they would have need of. And the Bible said that God blessed them. It was in the garden, brethren, that God placed Adam. Eden, meaning delight, loveliness, and tenderness, perfectly describe the first paradise. This garden provides the setting for the first act of God. The man, first acts of God, image the man, right? Because remember, man was created in the image and likeness of God. Irrigation was supplied. The Bible says by every fogs and by flowing river, right? And by water coming up out of the earth. So irrigation was provided. God himself planted the garden in Eden. And Adam was the gardener. So God, when God made man, God said, Adam, God put Adam in the garden. And God said, look here, Adam, you need to take care of the garden. Adam was the gardener there. 
this garden provided this, the, the God, like I said, God provided this garden. He put man in there, right? And Adam was the gardener. He was the one that took special care of the garden. The most outstanding feature of the garden, Virgin, was the tree of knowledge of good and evil that was in the midst of the garden. And there was a tree of life also. So the tree of life was there in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2 verse 9. Out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life is also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Both of them were in the midst of the garden. Adam ruled creation by his word. This God-given authority and dominion was delegated to him. In Genesis 2 verse 20, after God made all the animals, this is the dominion that God gave man. You know. After God made all the animals, God did not name them. God allowed the animals to pass by Adam. And anything Adam called them, it was so. And the Bible said that Adam gave the name to all the cattle, all the folds of the earth, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. So, God. Gave Adam this dominion and Adam was able to name all of the animals, all of the birds and everything that God allowed to pass by Adam. Adam named them at that time. Adam ruled creation by his word. So when we look at the passage that we read a while ago, we recognize that the Bible says that there was not an ill meat for Adam. That was in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 20, when God did the creation work, God, the Bible said that everything was done, was well done. But when it came unto man, I believe that, you know, God saw, you know, what Adam was thinking in his mind. Because Adam would have seen the, 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 the animals coupled together. He'd have seen the leopards together. He'd have seen. The cow and the bull, you would have seen all of the animals coupled together. But Adam would have been wondering in his mind, then, then why do, do I not have, you know, a mate? And the Bible says that God said, it is not good for man to be alone. So, no animal was able to, suitable, was a suitable companion for Adam as they were not of the higher order of spiritual beings, right? So God created Adam and helped me. So what God did was that he put Adam to sleep. And the Bible says, and the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make of him, make him and help me, right? So God put Adam to sleep. And when Adam was asleep, he took a rib from Adam. A rib was extracted from his side. And that rib the Lord used to fashion woman. The creation of Eve was equally miraculous to molding Adam from the dust of the earth. When Adam, when Adam woke up out of his sleep and saw Eve, he named her. The Bible said that Adam just as we name all the animals, it was Adam that named Eve. He said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, right? Because she has made from my bones. She has been made from my flesh. And from that day, the divine plan has been to join man and woman together as one flesh. So, Bridget, you know what we see happening in the world right now where, you know, people are saying that two males can get married or two females can get married. From the very beginning, it was not so. It was established by God, Virgin, that 
a man and a woman could be joined together. This wasn't in my lesson, but I just feel impressed to mention it. Because what is happening around us, what is happening in the world, there, there was some uproar the other day because some, some person, you know, said that they are transgender and they want to now swim with the woman and they were winning all of the races. But when they were swimming with the, 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 the men, they couldn't win races. And, you know, it was just one thing, you know, on, on, on the internet. But Virgin, the world is in chaos. And I want us to understand that from the very beginning, Virgin, God made a human pair, a husband and a wife. He made a man and a woman. Amen. And they were different from all of the other animals. Why were they different? Oh, glory to God. Why were they different? Because they, the two, the Bible says, shall become one flesh. No other pair of animals were able to be one in spirit and one in mind. But with the man and the woman, they were able to be one in mind and one in spirit. They were able to agree together, right? And the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. It said, Therefore shall a man leave his father, amen, and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I want us to know, Bridget, that Matthew Henry observed that, you know, the woman was made, and I always use this, you know, when I'm doing, you know, premarital counseling. Matthew Henry, you know, he observed that the woman was not made of, from the head of the man to top him, you know, nor out of his feet, you know, for him to trample on her but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. So God used a special part of man to mere woman, right? And is near to his heart for him to love her, under his arm for him to hold her and, and protect her and keep her and under from his rib, so that we can understand that, you know, both are equal. Amen. There are other things I could say, but we're sticking to the lesson. So we're going to point two now. So that was point one, the, the beginning of the dispensation. We'll look at the beginning of the dispensation. So we're going now to point two. The command that was given or what was expected, you know, of mankind. So the Lord is straightforward. He will not tell you something and mean something else, right? Anything God says, that's what he means. And, and, and what God, I like how God operates. You know, what he will do, he will tell you the thing. Just as we, he tell Adam, he said, Adam, the day you eat, you will surely die. And he told Adam that. And God he, he will, will, be, will tell you, you know, that this is what you should do. And this is what you should not do. If you do it, this is what is going to happen. He's not like the adversary that will pull a wool over your eye. And he will tell you that, no man, you will not surely die. You will not really die. You know, but God will tell you that, look here, the day that you do it, you will die. So there is a difference with how the Lord operates and with how Satan operates. Satan will try to pull a wool over your eye. But God will tell you the thing as it is. So the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. So he always tell you what to do and what will happen if you do it. And he will tell you what not to do and what happen if you don't do it. He said, enter ye at the straight gate. So this is Jesus now, you know. And he's saying, enter ye at the straight gate. He's telling you what to do. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go it there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So he tell you the gate that you should enter in through, and he will and he tell you the gate, what, what the gate lead to. He said one lead to destruction, but one lead to life eternal. And he does this because he know that as man we have the ability to choose. You know somebody. 
So man, man had to be tested because man was made with the ability to choose. Well, well, choose to do good or choose to do evil. God made us as free will moral being. So when we look back now at the command that was given, so like I said, God was God is will tell you what to do, tell you why you should do it, tell you what not to do, and then tell you the 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 the, the, the consequences of not doing it. So when we find now Genesis chapter 2, 15 to 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, I want us to mark it. I want us to make mental note of it. That the Bible was specific that God gave the command to the man. Because at this time, God had not made the woman from the rib of the man. So God gave the command to the man, saying, of every tree that is in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. With trees, Adam's did. Obedience was tested. So like I, like, I, like I said earlier on, that man, because he has the ability to choose good, he has he is made a free will moral being, will be tested. So with three Adam's obedience was tested. He could have eat of all the tree in the garden, include the tree of life. And the Bible did not record that Adam ate from the tree of life. I don't know how it plays out that way. But there was a tree bridging, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God clearly directed and clearly stated, clearly commanded Adam that in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou will surely die. In this dispensation, God's command for, for man to abstain from eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God warned of the punishment of physical and spiritual death. I want us to understand, Bridging, that man, when he partook of the fruit, or partook of the tree, whatever it was, he, the fact is that he disobeyed the command of God. And the fact that he disobeyed the command of God, Virgin, he died spiritually and he died, uh, eventually died physically. You know, the adversary said, you will not surely die. The adversary knew what would happen, you know. But he said, you will not surely die. But immediately as he partake of the tree, he died spiritually because... The, the, the line between him and God was now severed. The, 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 there was a, now a distance between him and God because Adam was out of his place. And we're going to get to that. And then now, eventually, he died physically. So God warned of the punishment of physical and spiritual death. The Bible says, Virgin, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Virgin, if you're listening to this and you're unsafe, the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Um, then we know what to know. Go to point three, which is look at man's failure to obey God's command. The command was given, and we read it in Genesis chapter 16. Chapter 2, 16 and 17. The Lord commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden, you could not, you should eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that is the tree you should abstain from. Right? We said that there were two trees in the midst of the garden. A tree also of life. And Adam did not eat of that. So God said, abstain from eating from this tree of knowledge of good and evil. God warned of the punishment of spiritual and 
physical death because of disobedience. Have you ever thought of what it would be like if Adam did not eat? Remember, the generations of the world were all in the lines of Adam. Even if Eve had it and Adam did not, there would still be a generation born of righteousness. But Eve gave to Adam and Adam ate, and we will look at it. But have we ever thought of what would happen, what it would be like if Adam did not eat? The story is told of a young man years ago. And the young man, you know, he came to his pastor and he, he asked him, say, oh, I, I, a bishop pastor, I wonder why Adam had to eat. Adam couldn't just go through and don't eat. You know, he, he said to his pastor, you know, pastor, if it was me, I would not eat from the tree. And the pastor said, really? So the, the pastor sat him down in his office, called him to his office one day and sat him down. And the pastor said, you see that dish that is covered up there? Do not lift up that dish for any reason at all. And the young man, the pastor, left him in the office. And the pastor had a fan blowing on the dish. When the pastor came in, he saw the young man picking up feathers all over the room. What the pastor did was that the pastor put feathers under the dish and put the fan on it. Once you lift up the dish, all of the feathers gone. This was the same young man that said, Pastor, if it was me, I would not dis have disobeyed God. I would have obeyed God. So the pastor pointed out to the young man that, you know, you were the one that said that you would have obeyed God. And I gave a simple task. I said a simple thing, you know, don't lift up the dish. But you, he said, why is it that you lift up the dish? He said, Pastor, I wanted to know what was under the dish, right? So, like I said, Man has the ability to choose, and I'm not sure why is it that, you know, even, even with, with, with our children, some of the time we say to them, don't do that. But they look at you and they still do the thing as if they want to experience what would happen if they do it. I, I, I'm not sure what, what, what took place, but God gave the command to Adam, and Adam disobeyed God. So man failure to keep God's command came through temptation from the devil. Note the cleverness with which Satan operates. He probe his probe was directed towards the woman who had received an indirect command from God through her husband. So remember, we pointed out you know, that it was God that put man in the midst of the garden. And it was God that said, Thou shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But when God now made Eve, God did not go back and you know, give, give Eve a command. What God did, what the man did was say, Look here, God, this is the command that God gave. He told his wife the command. This is what God said. God said, we must eat of every tree, but of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We should not eat of it. So what the adversary did you know, when he was alone, brethren, in Botuar, he said, boy, did God really say? So, and he caused her to ponder in her mind, you know, if, if, if the command that she heard from her husband that God said, if it's really that, you know, he said. So, man's failure to keep the command came through temptation from the adversary. So, now let us look at Genesis 3, 3, 1 through to 7. So, in Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 7, it tells us about, you know, the serpent and, and how he 
he was used by the adversary to cause Eve to question the command of God. No, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you, see, you realize what she said? She said, God had said, as if she really not sure if God did really say so, you know, because it was her husband that told her that if he shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. And the serpent said unto the woman, He shall not surely die. For God know it, for God know that in the day that he eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and he shall be as God's knowing good and evil. So the adversary asks Eve a seemingly innocent question. Had God said, did God really say that you must not eat from the tree? But in those words, he planted a seed of doubt. Doubt was cast upon God's command. Satan persisted his question, and why is God keeping you from, from eating the fruit of that tree? Can he really love you? Look here, the adversary will go to the lens, you know, to get you to, to, to disobey God. So, he, he, you know, he, and he knew how to turn it when he tempted Jesus. He said, didn't the Bible say that you must cast yourself and his angels will, 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 will catch you? It was Bible the adversary quoted on Jesus, you know. Can he really love you with such limitation telling you not to eat? Can he love you without, without having you to know good and evil? So the serpent accused God of being selfish, unjust, and cruel. He's not really interested in our welfare. He just doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to experience God like how he experienced God in the time past. So Satan also implied that he was knowledgeable about the tree as God. If you eat of this fruit, God knows that your eyes will be open and you will become as a God, knowing good and evil. So the adversary was telling Eve that look here, the tempter scheme began operating in Eve's mind after doubting God's word. And this is how it operates. You will put the thing before you, put the thing before you. Put the thing before you, and if you are not strong, eventually you will accept. So the tempter scheme began to operate in his mind after doubting God's word. She became discontented with her present co condition, toyed with the false ambition of becoming God herself, and she partook. Let us go to Genesis chapter 6, chapter 3, sorry, 6 and 7. And Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that which God forbid them to do, they did. And when the woman saw that it was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof. Remember, you know, the Bible says in James that God will not tempt you with evil. But the question would be asked then, God could not have made the garden without putting the tree in the midst of the garden for man to be tempted. Yes, God could have, but because God made man free will moral agent, he made us with the ability to choose that ability which must be tested. 
Oh, Jesus. And so Eve saw that the tree, the, the fruit was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took up the fruit and did eat and gave also unto her husband. And he did it. Bridging, I pause as I read here. Because remember, you know, Eve was alone. Oh, Jesus. When the Satan tempted her and she went there alone and eat from the tree. So she was not beside Adam. But then she took the fruit to Adam. And Adam ate. I wonder if when she ate. She recognized that she had seen, or it was after Adam ate, then both of them recognized that they sin. And when the woman saw that the food was good and pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, she took there of the fruit and she did eat and gave also to her husband. And her husband did eat and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron hallelujah so now we're looking at point three man failures Failure to obey God's command. Right? So we, we're saying that Satan implied that he knew he was knowledgeable. Um, Adam and Eve ate from the tree. Trust in the serpent. Eve ate the fruit. Then she persuaded Adam. Woman throughout history. Yeah, Go back, to the, go back to the slide. Women throughout history as always have their way with men. And when, I, when we get to the point of the study, when we will make, look at the two takeaways, this will be one of the takeaways that, that we want to have. Because we want the females to understand that they can break or they can make the marriage. It is where my spirit is leading to. You can make. I believe that our females do not understand that the power that they have. Oh, bless the name of God. It was God. I don't know what when, when Adam and God commune in the day, what, what God saw. The Bible said no man had seen God at any time. But surely there must be some manifestation where. Adam, Adam would commune in the day with God, in the cool of the day, the Bible says. And it was God that gave Adam the command. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. But the woman, the helpmate that God gave Adam, was able to say, Adam, eat this. And Adam disobeyed the command of God and ate, as his wife told him. So trusting the serpent, Eve ate the fruit and then she persuaded her husband to eat. So like we're saying that there is a certain power that, that women in marriage have. And, 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 and Eve was able to persuade Adam to disobey the command of God. You can imagine that God gave him the command and Eve was able to to. to Pain God, you know, because it pain God being, you know, because God was saying, Look here, I give you the commandment and you choose to disobey me. And when he when he was handing out the judgment, it came out. Samson loved Delilah. And Samson was so blind that he that he did not realize. I mean, God had a cause, but Samson was so blind that he did not realize that. Every time he told this woman that this is what my strength is, it was revealed to the Philistine. 
And finally, she persuaded him. What was it about her that she was able to persuade this man? And then Solomon, who was the wisest man, was led astray by a woman. So when Adam, remember when Adam saw Eve, you know, he saw the beauty, he saw part of himself. He said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It, 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 there was a certain thing that he saw. He, he was in love with the woman. I, he, he was in love with the woman. Sometimes as men, you know, we say that, you know, we're not doing this. And the wife is able to just persuade us. Even the bodies of men killing people. There's a lady at his house having like a little lamb. So Adam and Eve were innocent until they disobeyed God, bringing sin and death into the world. The Bible in, in, in Romans 5, verse 12. He said, wherefore as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So because of this one man, remember I said earlier on that we were all in the lines, the loins of Adam. And because we were in the loins of Adam, and Adam sinned, everything that proceeded out of Adam came with this Adamic nature, came we, we, we inherited sin. If Adam had realized, I believe, and would have known, because sometimes you know, we do some things and we say, boy, if me didn't know, if Adam knew the repercussion, you know, his decision would have had on mankind, I believe that he would have not it. He would have not disobeyed. The command of God. But by one man, sin entered the world. And death by sin. And death has passed upon all men. For all have sinned. So this death had, had affected their bodies, like I said earlier on. And it affected their souls. Adam and Eve sinned. They, when they sinned, they lost their innocence. And were immediately aware. Let us look at Genesis chapter 3, 7 to 11. And the eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the garden and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him where art so, the next point that I am going to make when, I, when we look at the section in terms of the two takeaways. So, the first takeaway is the influence that the wife has in the marriage. And the second point is where they, so they recognize that they were naked and they stood for themselves fig leaves together. There's a lot of things that we can talk about from, from that section in terms of holiness. And when we get to that point, we will make that point. So we said that the death affected their bodies and souls, both physical and spiritual, and those of their descendants, all who came from them. You know, this was the thing that they inherited. They must die. It's appointed unto man once to die and dead. After that comes the judgment. The Lord said, in that day that thou eatest of the tree, you shall surely die. And immediately they die spiritually. Their relationship with God was cut off and they eventually died spiritually. At the moment Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their innocence. And we read the scripture. 
they immediately were aware that they were naked and they hid themselves from the Lord. We are going to make a point there later. The couple tried to cover their sin, which they somehow associated with their sex organs. But their attempt was futile. And like I said, we'll get back to that. However, the Lord came looking for the couple, but he called out to the man. He could have said, Adam and Eve, where are they? But he said, Adam. Where are thou? Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. It was not that the Lord did not know where Adam was. Adam was now out of his place. Remember, God would come with in the garden in the cool of the day and would commune with Adam. So when he called out to Adam, God knows everything. And he said, Adam, where art thou? This call was a call, brethren. Not to say, where are you physically, but where are you spiritually? So Adam was at a place where he knew no sin, but now he was separated from God because he had sinned. He, he, he disobeyed the Lord's command. And because he disobeyed God's command now, he was separated from God. And God was saying, Adam, where art thou? He was in a place, virgin, where he communed with the Lord during the cool of the day, but he was now hiding himself. Oh, Jesus. And God said, Adam, where art thou? As I speak to us, virgin, there is a call of God saying to us, where are you? I would like to ask a question tonight. Let's go to the next slide. I would like to ask a question tonight. Where are you as the children of God, as children of the Lord? Where are you? What place are you in? Are you in the place where God expects you to be, where you come? To God in the cool of the day and commune with God. Are, are you out of that place? And God is making a call. Adam, Eve, where are you? Are we in the place where we are living holy? And acceptable unto the Lord. Are we in the place, bridging where we are praying, fasting, and reading the word as we should. Coming to church, Virgin, I want us to understand that coming to church is important. The Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourself together. But coming to church and showing up on a Sunday does not mean that you are saved. It does not mean that, you know, we are doing the things that we are supposed to do. It does not mean that we are praying. It does not mean that we are fasting. Coming to church on a Sunday does not say that we are in good stead. Bless the name of God. Jesus, we are in good stead with the Lord. Folks can come to church in a backsliding state. So if we are not praying, bridging, if we are not reading the word, if we are not living as God required us, then we are not in our place and we need to get back to doing the things that the Lord would have us to do. The song says, the little song says, read your Bible, pray every day and you grow, grow, grow. But if you don't read your Bible and forget to pray, you will shrink, shrink, shrink. Adam Virgin was out of his place because what he, was, what he did separate him from God. Are we doing the things? Are we involved in things? Jesus, that separate us. Are we doing the things that separate us from God? Or are we in our place? Virgin, none of us is perfect. But as much as we can with the ability that God has given us, we should try to, to stand up in our place. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. 
mark you. I know there are times when it's just rough. You're praying and the heaven seems like it is brass. Sometimes you go on your knees and you drop asleep. But when the time comes and, 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 and the anointing is there and the presence is there and do what you must do, man. Read the word. Pray. Even when, you, when it seems like the heaven is like brass, still try and pray. Brethren, just confessing. You see, Wednesday day fasting, I've been doing that from a young Christian. And you see, if me not fast on a Wednesday, me feel bad. Me at the age you now, me on medication. Sometimes they say, look here, put the medication aside. Fast enough to go on. And that is more Wednesdays than not. And I devise, I would devise ways how to take the medication, but still try and do the fast. I not giving any excuse why, why, why I should not fast. You know your condition. Whatever it is that you, the sacrifice that you can make, because that is what God accepts. So make the sacrifice. But if you are not in your place, brethren, God is a calling us to come back to that place. Let us get back to the place where we should be. Amen. Point four now. So we're looking at point four now. Um, the judgment that was pronounced. Amen. So Genesis 3 chapter Genesis chapter 3, 10 through to 13. So, so here now when we look at the, 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 the judgment that was pronounced, the blame game, you know, the blame game started. So here it was that the Lord came looking for the couple and he called out to Adam, Adam, where art thou? So what the man did, the man blamed the woman, the woman, right? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? As thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. And the woman said, The man said, sorry, The woman that thou gavest me Gave us to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. So what Adam was saying to God, you know, God, you know, say, really are your fault. Because of the woman where you give me. Some folks will say, boy, God, me never ask if you're a wife. <laughs> me never ask if you're a wife, you know, boy, you give me a wife. And the wife is the wife caused this. So really, in essence, that was what Adam was saying. The, the woman that thou gavest me, give me of the fruit and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, Is another blame? No, no. The woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So the Lord God said to Adam, so Thou eaten of the tree whereof I command thee not to eat. So God spoke to Adam first. Remember I said earlier on that it was Adam that God gave the command to. So that is why God got to Adam, you know. He said, I gave you a command. Did you disobey the command that I gave you? And Adam said, it was the woman. And the woman said, it was the serpent. So God pronounced judgment on the serpent. Genesis chapter 3, 14 to 15. We can look at it. And God first cursed the serpent. And the Lord God said, Unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above 
every beast of the field upon thy belly shall thou go and thus shall thou uh, and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life it is believed that you know the serpents had limbs before the curse and if you look at some of the cartoons this is how they portray some serpents you know with with hands and feet but anyway whatever it was god cursed the serpent right and the serpent was now to crawl on his belly and thus shall he eat all the days of the life then god no no in verse 15 he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God's ultimate solution to the seal problem is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. There we heard of the first Masonic prophecy, right? In God's grace, God would send one of the supernatural, one of a supernatural birth to redeem mankind. You know, this was the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. You know, he, he, this person would be truly innocent and would be able to provide a way of escape from the sinful nature we inherited from Adam. So God dealt with the serpent. Then now God dealt with the woman, God pronounced judgment on the woman, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. He said unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In, in sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be towards thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So the first man and woman were directed to multiply and replenish the earth. Through the birth process would come personalities that would live eternally serving God. In the beginning, childbirth was painless, was a painless joy. However, because of sin, the woman would there after experience pain in childbearing. Virgin, I have been to the hospital on three occasions, right? And the first time I went to the hospital, I almost cried. Why? Because, you know, what I heard other ladies were saying, you know, I was wondering if my wife would reach the same stage. You know, I really don't want even to say what the... the but I wonder if my wife would have, you know, been trying like 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 that other girl that you know was just mighty God. I, I, I tell you, the thing moved my heart as a man. You know, hats off to the ladies. But the Bible, it was because of sin why lady ladies have to go through this pain during childbirth. The next thing he said. In the passage, he said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. No, brethren, the word desire there. We can go to the next slide. The word desire there comes from an Hebrew word which means stretching out after or longing for. So it would seem that the woman desiring her husband would be a good thing and not a curse. However, to desire, there is not talking about something good. We, to understand the passage clearly, we must remember that God was now cursing. And because he was now putting a curse on the woman, it couldn't be anything good. So... It was a judgment on Eve for her transgression in Eden. So the Hebrew phrase in question, right, does not include a verb and is literally translated toward your husband, your desire. So that is what it, it, it reads in the original manuscript, right? Um, 
Simply put, the woman and the man would have ongoing conflict. So the most basic, straightforward understanding of this verse is that the, 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 the woman and the man would have ongoing conflict. But remember, you know, if you look at the last part of the verse, he said that your husband will rule over you. So it gives us an idea of what the, the passage was said was saying instead thy desire shall be towards thy husband amen and he shall rule over thee so the last part kind of help us to understand that there was some kind of you know usurping of authority some type of wanting of authority from the man but god said that the man now is going to rule over thee so so what god was saying the curse was now that when we look at them in the garden the situation was ideal there was no sin so so both of them enjoyed each other but in contrast to the ideal conditions in the garden harmony between adam and eve right their relationship will now have a strain the new living translation translate it and said, you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. So, so, so the desire there to desire your husband is not a good thing. Because Eve knew her place. He said to the woman, I will sharpen thy pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband. But he will rule over you. So what I'm saying now is that from that point onward, the woman would want to rule her husband. But God said that he will rule over you. That's off, brethren, to the women that are submissive in their marriage. Virgin, no amount of woman liberative movement can change the word of God. God says that the woman will want to desire to control the man, but the man will rule over the woman. The battle of the sexes had begun. Both man and woman would now seek the upper hand in marriage. That is why we always tell folks, you know, look here, you need to compromise. You need to look at what matters more to you and what matters more to your partner and see how you can come to, to, to a compromise. The man who was to, to love, lovingly care and nurture his wife would now seek to rule her. And the wife would desire to take control from her husband. It is important. To note that this judgment only states what will take place. God says that the man will live, the man and the woman will live in conflict and their relationship will become problematic. So, Bridget, even in the best of marriage, when you get married and, and you say, Yes, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and, and you're in love and you can't see any fault, Bridget. When you think it's peace and safety, it's sudden destruction. And it is the grace of God that is going to keep the marriage. So in the New Testament, however, God affirms this ideal relationship between man and a woman in marriage. Christ-like qualities are emphasized. What the curse of sinners is created Believers in Christ are called to correct by living according to God's spirit. So, Bridging, do a man and a woman come from two different backgrounds? I want us to understand, Bridging, that different belief systems, different way of growing up. God expects when the man and the woman come together that the marriage will work. 
And based on what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, it gives a blueprint. It says that the wife should willingly submit herself to her husband. That is not easy to do, you know. Oh, Jesus. Because of the sin problem. But when the wife, oh, Jesus, is living how God expects her to live, she will not have a problem submitting. So, like, we're talking about marriage, but we're going through the dispensation. It's a lot we can learn. And bridging husbands, so Ephesians 5, 22, it says, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. And God expect nothing less of the wife than for her to submit just as how you treat God. Bridging, God expect that's how you're supposed to treat your husband. Submit unto him that way. But then, So we said the wife, and let, and let me make my point out this. The wife that is living for God, she won't have, have much of a problem to submit. But husband, remember this. If the wife is not being loved, she will going to have a problem to submit. It is going to now take the Holy Ghost to say, look here, you need to do your part. So husband, you have a responsibility to, to love your wife. And the, the, the passage, look at what the passage do. The passage says, Wife, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. But look what he says about the husband. He says, Husband, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Next verse. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such things. But that is still talking about man supposed to love the wife, you know. But he's just using the example of how God loved the church. Or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Brethren, men. If you love the woman and you treat her good. So are men. Yes, it got, so are men to love their wives as their own bodies. So it, it used one passage to, to, to address the wife. But you see how many passages it used to address us as men. So are men to love their wife as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish it. Remember, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But no man hated his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it, it even as the Lord God, the church. 30. So, it continues and says because instead of us getting it wrong as men, the Bible says it started from 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 in one verse, you know, and it says that we should submit ourselves one to another. So verse thirty-four: We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. So the Bible. Spoke to the woman, one to the, to the wives, one verse. But about six or seven verses it used to speak to us as husband that we should love the wife. So see, see there in Ephesians 5, verse 21. That's how, it, that's how the apostle started, you know, when he, he was now addressing marriage. He says, Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So let us know as men not think that, look here, it's only the wife alone should submit. And I have authority. And the Bible says that we should submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God.
So now God pronounced judgment on the man. Perjurin. God pronounced judgment on the Lord. The Lord now moved to pronounce judgment upon the man. Genesis 3, 3 9, 17 to 19. So God gave the man the command. He said, you must not eat, but man now. Because him love him wife. Because his wife has influence over him. He choose to do what the wife says over what God says. Amen. And unto Adam, he said, because thou was Hearken unto the voice of thy wife. And has eaten of the tree. Which I commanded thee. Hey, Jesus saying thou should not eat of it. So, so God was now saying to Adam. Adam I give you the commandment. You know. You, you, you love your wife more than how you love me. Jesus. And has eaten of the tree which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Virgin, look at the passage. God said, Curse be the ground for thy sake. What did the ground do? But it shows you how angry God was, if I can use such a word with God. How angry God was. God. You disobey me and obey your wife. It's a curse to be the ground. Five days for thy sake. He said, In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken from dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. So, know what God gave Adam the command, like I said, and it was the man that he gave the command. No doubt Adam would have told Eve what was required of them, and God was, 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 was wrought, and God the ground. It was the ground that grew the tree and God cursed the ground because of Adam. The whole earth which was made for man and all things in it of which he had possessions and dominion was, no, was man's greatest blessings. But this was now turned into a curse because of sin. So when the animals should have brought forth and the tree should have bring forth fruit they did not sow because there was a curse. So the insects started affecting the crops. Flood come and wash out things. Drought come and so forth. So what we see happening now when we see drought and, and, and then floods come, it is a result of sin. So let us not question and say, why well, God just sit down and just allow these things. Um, it is because of sin why we see these things. So whenever we see a country in experience famine and whenever we see floods, understand bridging that it is because of the sin we are reaping the consequences of sin. So he said to Adam, in sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Meaning that with much trouble and toil, bridging, you have a plant up near it, you have a plant a tree yet, and you want the tree to come. I remember the, the thing was so, so hot day that day. If two days pass and I don't water the crops, the leaves, them start to dry up. And now we're getting a lot of water. So in sorrow, shall thou eat of it all the day. You, you, you have to put in the work in order to, to, to eat. In manuring, in cultivating the earth, he should get his livelihood out of the produce. We have to put in the work now. And then he say, in the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat bread. So man has to work now by the sweat of his brow, he shall eat bread. In these last days, there's a lot of folks that want to get rich quick overnight and they will tell you that they want to get rich quick or die trying. But easy come, easy go, brethren. That is why they burn in the U.S. 
burn it, they just take the US and then just burn them up in the dance hall because easy come, easy go. Some folks would rather to beg your brethren than to work for it. So there was a man there that day that him said, beg you something. I said, boy, you want to work? The man said, me tell you, I want to work. Serious. And that was, was near church here at the stoplight. When I said, you want to work? The man said, me tell you, I want to work. I beg you $100. The man don't want any work. Folks, there are men that will rather to beg you than to, than to work. And what the Bible says? He said, if a man don't work, he not to eat. He said, sometimes we take up our money and give them. They refuse to work, you know. And if you follow the Bible, probably some, some man, because some man will tell you, they will kill you and go to prison and get three square meals a day. Get three square meals a day and you're not working. If you follow the principle of the Bible, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, if you want to look at it, fine. If a man don't work, he must eat. And what the apostle said, it is a command. So, Bridget, sometimes we take out, because we have this soft heart, we take out, we, and we say, a man beg you $100 a game. Why am not working? Tell him, say, you want to give him a work and see what he said. He said, for when we were with you, this we what? Tell you? No. He said, this we commanded you. Strong word that, you know. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. And it comes back to Genesis, you know. God said, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat. You have to put in the work. If you are going to reap the rewards. In the sweat of your face, thou shalt eat. So, so, so some folks are wondering. Yes, some folks are wondering. Why it's so strenuous? Because you put in the hours at work. You, you put in little extra time to see if you can build up. And when you get the, the money, you realize that you can't do anything. Or it, 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 it does not cover all of what you want it to cover. But brethren, there is a sin problem. And we have to contend with that until we leave this place. So one more before we close. So let us go to the, 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 the yes. Salvation type or mode of deliverance. So in every dispensation, there is a judgment that is handed out. However, God has always made a way of escaping that judgment. I want us to understand that the Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed the command of God. The righteousness of God demanded that sin be punished by death. But the grace of God intervened. Unmerited favor was now at work. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Adam and Eve received unmerited favor. I want you to understand, Bridget, that from this passage, there is so much that we gain looking onto other passages in the passages in, 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 in the future, so to speak, in other scriptures later on. So, and to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of the skin and clothe them. So what God did here was God slaughtered the animals. He introduced a biblical principle that is found in Hebrews 9 verses 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And I want us to find that. Because, Bridget, remember now, the righteousness of God demanded that, that, that Adam and Eve be put to death because they disobeyed God. Now, God, the only thing that can appease him is blood. And so God, in his 
wisdom knew that Adam and Eve would sin. So what he did, he prepared animals that he knew would have sort of suffice for this moment. And almost all things that are by the law purged with blood. But this principle, principle was from the very beginning in the garden. Almost all things are purged by the law with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or there is no forgiveness. So God, in order to appease his wrath, slaughter the animal, introduce a biblical principle without the shedding of blood, it was a way for him to forgive Adam and Eve. God also showed mercy by killing an innocent animal, providing the skins to cover or to atone for their sin. This was also a type of Christ. Jesus was the spotless lamb. Throughout all the dispensation, it is by God's grace towards mankind why they receive a salvation type. This provision showed the inadequacy of man's attempt to atone for his own sin and the sufficiency of God's atonement. God then removed them from the garden and placed angels to guard it from anyone eating the tree of life and live forever. Bridget, I, a, lot of, a lot of searching is taking place. And what, what people are really searching for, you know, if, if to see if they can find anything resemble, you know, coming from the tree of life or, 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 or something like that. Because, you know, man really want to live without dying. And it's just an effect. So God used the flood virgin to just mask it. So we're looking at the, the one or two takeaways. We're not going to get into that tonight, but just to introduced to, to us. I think the time elapsed already. So just one or two take away. We, we, we said that the couple realized that they were naked and we're going to use this next week. God's willing to talk about um, how, to, how the couple realized and, and you know, what that should mean to us. And then we, we want to look at, you know, Adam said, because you have, God said, because you have heeded to your, the voice of your wife and this it shows the influence that the wife has on the marriage. So when we come next week, all being well, we'll just do a quick recap and we'll just start here, you know, you know, to and, 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 and then continue into the other dispensation. God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you were blessed. Hope the Lord spoke to your spirit. Um, God's willing, next week, same time, same place, you know, we'll get in the word of God again. Word of God again. So let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you, mighty God, for your love, your mercies. We thank you for the word, mighty God, that was presented. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you know it will accomplish what you will. We pray that hearts will be blessed. We pray that minds will be touched, that your lives will be transformed. And we ask God that it will be a motivator for folks living for you as you expect them to. Have it your way as we dismiss. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.